My wife tells me I need a hearing aid, but I keep fighting it. Uh, I keep telling her to talk louder. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I'm George Chapa. I turned uh, not as old as this guy right here. My God, 98 years old. Uh, I'm 94, turned 94 in June. Uh, you know, I'm in awe of this group, even though I'm a, met a member. I haven't been here very, very much. I spoke here when Jack Hammett was still the president, and uh, that's a long time ago. And uh, I can say I'm really in awe uh, of all you guys. My God, there's so much experience here. Uh, you, you can sink a battleship. Uh, but anyway, uh, I'll tell you what I did in a few minutes. Uh, I'm no hero. I'm like a lot, a lot of you guys. Uh, we've all said that the heroes in our graves. There's a lot of guys that are uh, wounded, terrible shape, and they're heroes also. But uh, what I did is a, is a job I, I didn't really want. And I think uh, none of you would have wanted the job either from what I've heard. Uh, but uh, let me start off with telling you, uh, I graduated from high school the same day I was 17. That's Fred Whitaker there. He's in one of my films. Hello, Fred. Anyway, I uh, didn't get a chance to talk to Fred. <laughs> Just saw him. I don't think he saw me yet. But anyway, uh, for one year I worked at Douglas Aircraft on SBD dive bombers. You guys in the Navy know about that airplane. And my job was to get in the cockpit and do all the finishing touches. And my gosh, I thought, boy, would I love to fly one of these things. And uh, my brother was uh, in the Air Corps, Army Air Corps, and my brother-in-law in the Air Corps. Um, my brother was a flight engineer in B-29s and my, my never got out of the country. And uh, my brother-in-law was a P-38 pilot. He did get out of the country. He got shot down in Germany, but he lived. He uh, bailed out and landed in a tree like most guys that, that jumped out of planes. Seems like a lot of trees over there to land in. But anyway, he fell out of a tree and broke his back. And he, he was treated pretty well because the Germans uh, treated uh, officers pretty well. Uh, Non-commissioned guys, not s so well from what I've heard. I actually did, did a film about the 8th Air Force. Uh, they had 26,000 guys killed and, and they had uh, uh, 42,000 uh, uh, casualties. They had more killed than the Marines in the Pacific, believe it or not. Uh, when, a, when a bomber went down, 10 guys went down. You have a member here, Fred Selling. I understand he's not doing too well. Uh, he's in one of my films and I don't know if you've heard his story, but if you haven't, uh, I'm not here to tell his story, but he's got one fantastic story because he was a lone survivor of a B-17 that he was flying. All the guys were killed except him. Talk, talk to Harry about it. Let him tell you about it. Or see my film. I've got five films up there, DVDs. Uh, the reason I haven't been coming here as much as I would like to, because I really respect what you all are doing and talking to kids in schools, and I do a lot of that also. I've, I've done, I've talked to thousands of kids here in Southern California and also in France and Belgium. They love to have a GI come back and talk to them. Little kids, 11 years old, they know all about the war. Of course it happened there, but they know about it. I've talked to special needs kids over there, I've talked to university over there. So I've talked to a lot of people uh, over there who are very, very appreciative of the American soldier. Now you hear a lot of, about the people in Europe who don't like us. I'll tell you, I know a lot of people over there who love us. I just came back from Normandy, and I'll tell you that in a minute, but let me only have 30 minutes, so I gotta talk fast. Uh, and uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm talking loud, so you can hear me. Uh, when I turned 18, first thing I did is try to enlist in the Air Corps, Army Air Corps. Uh, and, uh, you know, I saw my, my brother and my brother-in-law uh, walking around with a swagger, uh, their hats tilted and all the girls uh, chasing them. And I thought, man, that's what I want to do. And so w when I was working on those SBD dive bombers, my job was to help tow them out on a tarmac. And I did all the finishing touch touches in the cockpit. So I pretended like I was flying that airplane. And uh, it, it was a great job that I had f until I turned 18. The minute I turned 18, I tried to get in the Air Corps. I tried twice. My eyes were 20-22 and I couldn't make it. And so uh, the doctor says, well, eat a lot of carrots. And uh, the first time I flunk, eat a lot of carrots, carrots and come back, which I did uh, like an idiot. I'm eating carrots all over the place at Douglas Aircraft. 
And, uh, and the, when I flunked this, uh, it, it, it again the second time, uh, well, forget about the carrots, I was ready to get drafted. So I did get drafted. I got sent to Cheyenne, Wyoming in the winter, November of uh, 43. And uh, that, that winter, which got me ready for the Battle of the Bulge because the Battle of the Bulge was the coldest winter in 30 years. And I survived that maybe thanks to the training in Cheyenne, Wyoming. It was cold there. Anyway, uh, uh, what happened is uh, I, had the, I, I contracted the flu on the way there. So I was in a hospital for a week as soon as I got there. I was in bed 13, ward 13. All the guys are kidding me. The guys in that, in that bed before died. And so they're all telling me drink a lot of water. Anyway, I survived that. But then when I found out what I had to do in the Army, uh, I, I was going to be in the Graves Registration Company. How many of you know what that is? Oh, quite a few Army guys. Okay, now, I'm sure you didn't want the job, right? Because uh, the, the word is that from guys that know about Graves Registration, it's probably the worst job in the Army. So anyway, uh, uh, in, in uh, April, uh, I shipped out. Uh, I was a replacement, uh, thanks to my company commander, when he found out the Air Corps accepted me because they had lowered the I requirements to 2030. And as soon as I found that out, and they were at our base recruiting, I said, here I am, you know. So I took all the tests, passed everything, notified him, boom, out of that company and into the 607th Graves Registration Company, there was short one guy, that was me, I was a replacement. I was uh, 18, I was the youngest guy in, a, in that whole company, uh, 607 at 24, 200, excuse me, 124 officers and enlisted men. Uh, and they had uh, five platoons, four platoons, headquarters platoon. So we ship out, the guys are all teasing me, don't worry Champa, they're gonna turn a ship around and take you home because Roosevelt said, no 18 year old will set foot on foreign soil. I don't know if any of you know that, but that's the truth. And I had a cousin killed in the Navy at 17. You know, you could enlist in the Navy when you're 17. Uh, a lot of guys lied about their age, 16 years old, that, uh, in the Army, and, uh, and, and a lot of them were killed. And uh, so on the way over, I got all this kidding. Uh, They're all older than I was. And so we, we arrived in England and uh, then they split us up. I don't know why, but they, they split us all. Uh, guys going to sleep. I hope I'm not boring, but uh, <laughs> I'll try to make it a little more interesting as I go along. Uh, anyway, uh, I was in England for about a month and a half. Uh, they split us up uh, and, and for some reason or other, they sent one of our platoons uh, to the coast of England, a, a place called Slapton Sands. And how many of you know about Exercise Tiger? Hey, quite a few. Okay, well, let me tell you about Exercise Tiger. In my opinion, it was a stupid exercise to practice landing at Omaha Beach. They had uh, uh, four LSTs off the beach and uh, a couple of German E-boats sunk three of the four of them. And uh, our first platoon was on one of them. We lost 18 this has got chills. We, we lost 18 guys uh, and six survivors. Ironically, the six survivors were all, all privates. We lost our first lieutenant, master sergeant, all non-commissioned officers, and just like that, in a blaster. I've seen different numbers, but approximately 800 guys were killed in a flash. I think it was on April the 25th, if I'm not mistaken. Correct me, any of you guys that know better, I think it was April 25th. Anyway, uh, when we heard that, God, I mean, we all looked at each other and this is no dry run. You know, we're in the war. And so, uh, I've cut through a lot of this for the sake of time, but when uh, we shipped out uh, on a Liberty ship, and on the ship uh, going over to Normandy, uh, we had a frightening experience. Uh, I, I, I met a Navy gunner that day. And, and ironically, he was a guy that shot down this torpedo plane that was getting ready to torpedo us in the middle of the night. We're down in a hold of the ship, and all of a sudden a blast, and the ship is rocking like crazy. Come to find out, the, 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 the guy that I met was 18 years old, like I was, from uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. And uh, if he didn't shoot that plane down, he probably wouldn't be here now. So that was our first experience with uh, 
uh, with any uh, anything that was really frightening. The next experience was hitting a, a mine, uh, but we, we were off quite a ways to, to, to where the blast was, so that didn't really gave our ship a little bit of rocking, but not much. I had two life preservers. I had a Mae West on and I had a life belt on because I couldn't swim. I still can't swim. <laughs> My wife is not here, she's shopping right now. She just dropped me off, but she's heard me talk enough. But she, uh, uh, she's trying to teach me how to float and uh, I can't even float. I, I don't like the water. That's why I didn't join the Navy. <laughs> but then I didn't find out what was to come uh, because and we were in five campaigns in, in France, Belgium, and Germany, including the D-Day invasion and, uh, and the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, we, we started out uh, in Normandy, and uh, uh, my unit got the Croix de Guerre because we were the first graze registration company to go in there and had a miserable job. We were, we were putting paratroopers, wrapping them up in their parachutes and, and burying them. At that time, we were segregated. And uh, we had black soldiers uh, that had to dig graves, but they only did that for a short while, very short while, because we, we got prisoners right away there in, in Normandy. And uh, we initiated probably four, four or five temporary cemeteries just there in Normandy. And of course, all those, all those bodies that were buried there in the temporary cemeteries later in 1947, when they built permanent cemeteries, they had to all be disinterred and put in lined caskets and, and uh, buried uh, at, at the uh, Omaha Cemetery uh, in that particular case where th these, these are all the guys who were buried in Normandy. Uh, we went through Normandy. Uh, in St. Lo, we had a temporary cemetery. That's when Patton came in. And boy, what a sight that was. Uh, they came in through the port of Cherbourg. And uh, those where General McNair was killed uh, from friendly fire from uh, our 8th Air Force bombs. And, and uh, we, were, we were right there. And uh, in fact, I did, a, I did a film about the, I think I mentioned it a while ago, about the 8th Air Force. It's up there at the desk. And uh, so anyway, from St. Lo, uh, we moved on into the liberation of Paris, and that was that was great, you know. And uh, it's almost like the war had ended, and uh, all the celebration and everything. And uh, uh, you, you went through there in convoys, and all these people are throwing flowers at you. You know, the, the French, in fact, the Europeans, uh, they're very big on flowers. I think more so than we are here. I'm going to get to that in a minute, but if I have time. But anyway. Uh, we, we, uh, we had a temporary cemetery about 20 miles outside of Paris, and so we got a chance to go to Paris for the day, the only day off I had in 11 months, and boy did I celebrate that day. I mean, I, I almost, well, I came close to being missing because I didn't answer the roll call. They dropped us off in Paris and said, get back here at the Bastille Tower at 6 o'clock. Hell, it doesn't get dark till 11, and we were still drinking at 6 o'clock. Uh, we, we got into a, a, a house there for dinner. Uh, they were Greeks, and my buddy was Greek and spoke Greek, and they wouldn't let us go. We had plenty of Greek food and drinks. We left there. We were pretty smashed. We were trying to find our way out of, out of Paris to get back to Solar, a little town in, in, out of Paris, and we couldn't find our way out. But uh, that's it. Uh, the, uh, one of the uh, uh, car, uh, the uh, free French of the interior car came up, pulled right up next to us. Two guys jumped out and two beautiful girls. And the most beautiful girl took my arm and the other ugly one took my buddy's arm. <laughs> and uh, he, he was like a big brother to me. You know, I was at that point, I'm 19 years old and uh, he, he's about 30. And uh, so, but anyway, we hit all the bars along the Champs Elysees. And, uh, and we couldn't find our way out. It, we only knew the route number. And a couple of GIs saw us trying to find our way out. And we told them our sad story. They said, well, come and stay with us. They're staying in the University of Paris. So we did for the night. We slept on the floor, which was a hell of a lot better than what we had. So we got out the next morning with the help of Free French of the Terrier, gave him a pack of cigarettes and took us right back. My buddy was found absent. I wasn't. And that's a long story I won't go into. But anyway, we went on into Belgium, uh, initiating temporary cemeteries there. There I met a man who, who had worked for Shirley Temple's father here. And he had uh, tried to uh, go back to Belgium for a visit, and he couldn't leave. So he asked me to write to George Temple 
I let him know he was okay because he couldn't even write to him. They wouldn't allow it. So anyway, uh, we went on through Belgium and uh, we ended up in a place called Umborg, which is right next to Henri Chapelle, the little village of Henri Chapelle in Obel. Uh, Henri Chapelle is one of the uh, largest cemeteries over there. At, at one time, it was uh, among the three top cemeteries. That was uh, 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 Henri Chapelle in Belgium, and the other one was uh, uh, Saint Avold, which is not too far from Metz, France, close to the German frontier. Uh, and, and the other one, uh, Omaha Beach. Those three are the three biggest cemeteries. Right now, uh, Omaha and St. Olivo are the biggest cemeteries, right around 10,000. Henri Chappelle is close to 9,000. In, in Holland, 8,300. Uh, there are several cemeteries not too far from each other over there in Belgium. There's two in Belgium, one in Holland and one in, in Luxembourg. That's where Patton is buried. Anyway, uh, uh, getting ahead of my story a bit, but uh, so we, uh, uh, th there was a big standstill there right after the liberation of Paris. Uh, well, probably a couple of weeks later, really, because, well, no, it was, uh, it was a month later, I'll tell you why, because uh, Paris was liberated in August uh, of 44, and, uh, and, uh, and actually uh, uh, the breakthrough was in September of 44. Excuse me, November. I was there in September. My company was there. We picked up bodies before the Battle of Bulge, during the Battle of Bulge, and after the Battle of Bulge. When we left that area, we had 17,300 buried there. And, uh, and, uh, and, and now uh, there's uh, just under 9,000. 9, uh, it's uh, the first time I went back was 50 years later. I had a chance to go back 40 years later when Reagan was president, but uh, uh, I didn't want to go back. Like so many other guys, I never wanted to go back. And uh, uh, my late wife, she was still living then. That, that, uh, that was uh, uh, actually four years before Clinton. Uh, I went, the 50th Clinton was the president. Uh, and then... Uh, I've been back every five years from 1950, and I've been back there a couple of times in between. We have a lot of friends over there in France and in Belgium. And uh, anyway, uh, we gathered approximately 75,000 dead soldiers. That's American and German because we picked up the Germans, they didn't. We had temporary cemeteries for the Germans across the road from the Americans. Uh, it, uh, it was very traumatic for me uh, about two weeks after D-Day, uh, yeah, about two weeks, uh, I kind of fell apart one day. I, I just couldn't, I, you know, it was, I, when I was a little boy, I had a big fear of death. And I can't go into it now because it's going too long. And, uh, and so uh, uh, it was hard for me, especially, uh, to be around dead bodies. And uh, uh, you, you, you couldn't, I had to look away uh, from their faces. And uh, it, uh, uh, it, was, it was so traumatic, I just couldn't handle it. And so our lieutenant uh, pulled out his 45 and he said, you get your ass back up there and suck it up. That's the exact words he used. And you know, they didn't baby you uh, in World War II. I mean, there's too much going on, too fast. And, uh, it, uh, you're not going to get any psychological training, I'll tell you that. Uh, you guys have been World War II, you know what I'm talking about, and I'm sure it was the same in Vietnam and Korea. And I have a lot of respect, by the way, for you guys, uh, Korea and Vietnam, and especially Vietnam, because of what you had to go through when you came home. Uh, I didn't come home until January of the next year, uh, because I was in the Army of Occupation for seven months. And uh, uh, it, uh, all the celebrating was done when we got off the ship in uh, in uh, New Jersey on uh, January 13th, 1946, Red Cross was there. The only thing I wanted was a bottle of milk. Uh, I, I drank milk until I was 65. Uh, now I drink wine with dinner. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, my, my late wife died, died in, in uh, 81, and I raised my two kids uh, who were girl 11 and boy 10 uh, for 10 years, the thing I'm most proud of. And uh, for anybody else who's been a single parent here, you know what I'm talking about. And so 
uh, for 10 years I didn't date me an Italian not dating and uh, and so boy I sure made up for it later though any any anyway don't feel sorry for me uh, uh, you ladies out there I got to tell you a story you won't believe uh, uh, what uh, anyway uh, my wife had lymphoma which is a form of cancer uh, she, uh, she, when she was 45 years old and for five years she lived and they told her that she was gonna live for six months so we were on dynamite all that time and it, it was tough for all of us and when when she passed away it was really tough on my kids and uh, they didn't know she was dying and I was hoping she wasn't going to die so and they, they were in school and they were playing Little League and you know, I didn't want to have them go through anything traumatic and they're still still going to school so anyway we did it together three of us uh, without any help and and uh, I was working for the LA Times and they were very good to me the LA Times used to be a fantastic place to work at that my boss told me to go home and take care of my wife and kids I had a, a lower management job and he and uh, and I did for three months I didn't step foot in that office I got full pay and uh, he was a fantastic guy had a lot of heart and uh, so when I started working again I, I, I worked very hard in, in appreciation because I was pretty much my own boss I used to put together special sections anyway so so uh, how much time do I have Scott eight minutes how much eight minutes eight minutes that's a lifetime <laughs> anyway okay let me try to sum it up then because I could talk to you all day uh, I just talked at Rotary Club in Manhattan Beach the other day had about 100 people there fantastic one of the questions I asked them how many of you have visited a military cemetery abroad how many how many Wow very good very good well those of you who haven't you're missing something uh, they're, they're beautiful cemeteries very well kept white marble crosses and stars of David and and, uh, and they uh, they're well kept and the, the citizens there who who uh, they, they join a little organization they get a certificate for about their soldier uh, because you know how many of you realize like those of you who have been there do you know what it says on the crosses stars of David do you know that the date of birth is not there any of you know that I talk to people all the time who have visited the cemeteries and they don't even know that the date of birth is not on the cross as the stars of David when I went back there for the 50th anniversary and I saw that and with my kids and then my fiance because my late wife had passed away and I met this other lady 10 years later in 91 but anyway uh, it really struck me and as I walked through there and I looked back at my kids and I said you don't know this nobody knows this how old these guys were because there's no date of birth I contacted ABMC and they said that's the way it was done in World War one so they carried that on through again stupid 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 because when people go through there they have no idea that this 18 19 20 year olds kids buried there kids that never many never had a girlfriend much less married with kids like me I lived I'm now 984 I've had a good life they died they died for us and and you know what when you hear the words the high price of freedom they're only words right but I can tell you I know other guys that did the work I did the combat medic medics that saw this every day uh, and I did for 11 months we know the high cost of freedom freedom because we saw it I mean I can still see some of these bodies and uh, it, it's um, I never did have nightmares my sister said I did I don't remember a nightmare or a bad dream do I ever think about it yeah sometimes it's, even now I'll, uh, because I'm making a lot of talks now and so I'll freshen my mind I'll think about it in the I'll wake up in the middle of the night and think of, think about it but I don't let it bother me when I got out of the army I was still 20 couldn't buy a beer in California uh, and uh, it uh, I just wanted to have a good time and that's what I did until I went to El Camino College for two years and then I went to SC the next two years and I had a, a good job and and uh, a good life I had a great uh, late wife from Montana a great f f girl that grew up on a ranch and then I, lucky again with the wife I've had have now that we've, we've been married about 23 years now and uh, since 1996 
And she and my kids is the ones that talked me into going back for the 50th anniversary. So uh, I've been doing, I haven't been coming to these meetings, although I've been talking to a lot of kids uh, because I've been working so damn hard on these films. I've had to raise all the money myself. I've had to do all the logistics and uh, the storyline for the films and everything. So I've been a really busy guy. I've been living in Palm Springs now uh, for uh, about 12 years full time. We live in Torrance uh, in the summer when we're not here, when I'm not out doing a film. Uh, and we, uh, we live in Palm Springs where I'm going right after this meeting. And, um, and then I come, back to, I come back to Torrance and then I'm going on September 1st, I'm going to Europe, not to Normandy. I've been there many times. I'm going to Alsace Lorraine where we have good friends there. It's a long story. Uh, I knew the father who was a free French of the interior. Uh, and and, and, and these, this couple in, in Belgium, uh, Nico was a mayor of six villages. He did the 50th anniversary of Belgium's liberation uh, 25 years ago. And so he's, he, I mean, excuse me, yeah, it was the 50th anniversary. Now he's doing the 75th anniversary of Belgium's liberation. He said, George, you've got to come. He's my translator on all my films. And uh, there, there were three of us uh, uh, veterans there for his 50th anniversary. And now I'm the only one. Uh, and so he just begged me, you've got to come back. So we're going back there uh, for that. And uh, so is my time up? Okay. Can I ask a question? Any questions? Yeah. yeah, why don't you? Uh, I've always been curious. In the Army, we issued two dog tags, and they both had notches in them. Yeah. Is it true that? No, it's not true. It's not true. No. <laughs> he wanted to know if we put those in the teeth. Right. No, uh, I guess that was what they, the die cast when they did those dog tags. Uh, but we put uh, left one on the body and one on a marker. It was our job, we had straight markers because we were the first ones there. Other grades of registration came in, they put wooden crosses. And then two years after the war, they put marble crosses and stars of David. And they're absolutely beautiful. If you ever get over to Europe, you, you gotta see. I've seen all the cemeteries over there except one. I've seen one of them in Italy, all of them in France, two in Belgium, one in Luxembourg, one in Holland. <laughs> so. Uh, very, very, very impressive. The guys that have been there can tell you. Uh, if you go to Europe, you go to Paris, get on a train, go to Normandy. Uh, but anyway, uh, any other questions? A lot of them. Question. Could you speak to the subject matter of your CD? How did you come up with it? Those DVDs on the table, there's five of them that I've done since 2006. What's the background on them? What, what motivated you to do them? Pardon? What motivated you to do these CDs? They're on my website. You go to my website and buy. Is that what you're asking? No, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. you what motivated you to make? Oh, what motivated me? A lot of things motivated me. First of all, my daughter motiv motivated me when she and her brother were with me at the Normandy Cemetery 50 years later, and said, "Dad." I'd like to do a documentary sometime about freedom. She directed my first film. She now has a daughter that's autistic and a son and divorced and she didn't have the time. She wanted to go back with me this time and couldn't. But anyway, yeah, that, that and the fact that I, I'm trying to impress young people in particular, if you look at my website, I have some cards here. Uh, uh, my website is to teach young people in particular about the high price of freedom. Because I can talk, as I told you earlier, I can talk about the high price of freedom because I saw it. I never forgot it. And that's why I decided to, to do, I was only gonna do one film. By the way, I don't do it for profit. You'll see on my card, 100% nonprofit, 501c3. I, I helped Scott and Jack to get the 501c3 started here. Uh, with the same lady that's been doing mine, she's passed away now. But anyway, um, yeah, it, uh, uh, I feel, you know, other than talking to kids in schools, uh, doing DVDs, I mean, you should see the emails I've had over the years of people telling me to keep doing what I'm doing, that it's so important to reach these young people, and, uh, and so that's what I've been doing. Has there been a little bit of a healing process for you in speaking with the children to kind of, uh, in, in a sense, I know it's, it's challenging, especially in our day and age right now with children being so inundated with instant gratification and yeah. uh, just electronics and not realizing, you know, the, 
what you talked about, the price of freedom. Has it, has it been right, exactly. uh, good for the heart, so it good for the soul, so oh, to speak? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. The children responding to you. Yeah, I know it's helped me a lot. The kids respond very well. And, and, and the people over there, the kids over there are unbelievable. We've talked to kids 11 years old, special needs kids, you know, high school, college. I've spoken to many, many thousands of kids over there and here. And I'm going to keep doing that until I die. I live in Palm Springs. I've only been to one high school down there, and that's the uh, uh, Cathedral City High School. I've been there twice talking to ROTC. And uh, uh, when I was doing the documentary, I got uh, 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 AP came out to film me, and I and we went to the school where I was talking to the kids, and that's on film. And they tell me, and I said, where's that going? And they said, all over the world. I've been on a lot. A lot. I, I've got to uh, tell you a couple of things that, in raising funds. You guys have been doing that. It's hard, hard, hard job. But you know what? Um, I was out of pocket, $80,000 at one point, 50, and I got down to 25,000 out of pocket. I told my wife, I gotta do this. I just have to do it. And so everything broke loose the last couple of weeks. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, a clothing company gave me $35,000. They, they make, it's a, a couple of GIs from Afghanistan that started a little t-shirt business. You know, everybody wants something written on a t-shirt. And they, sell, they were doing the D-Day 75th anniversary for $27. I got $5 from 7,000 shirts they had sold at that point. So I got 35,000. Now I understand there's been other souls because they ran out on June 6th and I'm looking for another 13,000. So that was the best thing that happened to me. And then also I got on a Martha McCullum show. How many of you know about that show on Fox News? It comes on at four o'clock here, seven o'clock in New York. I got on that show and, and uh, there's a studio in Palm Springs. By the time I got home, looking at my cell phone, I had 155 hits on my website. I got $25,000 from people with fantastic comments. Unbelievable, very heartwarming. And then I also got Gary Sinise, who's been a good friend of mine uh, for a long time. Uh, and by the way, that foundation that he has is fantastic because he, he does more than Bob Hope because he builds homes for guys and gals that are missing limbs. And, uh, and he gave me $7,500, and he gave me 15000 for my fifth film. So I, I've had, but in the meantime, I'm having one hell of a time, because although American Airlines provided the transportation, I, I had to house 25 people and feed them and uh, pay for my cinematography and editing, which I'm still paying for my editing. And, uh, and so I had a lot of expenses. If, if American Airlines didn't provide the transportation, these films would not have happened. They, they did for four of my films. Yeah, let's get, I try to answer them quicker. George, there's been a lot of conspiracy around the death of General George Patton. What's your feelings? Pardon? There's been a lot of conspiracy around the death of General George Patton. What are your thoughts? Well, you know, I was there in Mannheim, Germany, because I was in the Army of Occupation for seven years, uh, seven months. And um, he, he was killed when I was there. The theory is the Russians did it, they set it up. Uh, and so I wouldn't be surprised because, you know, he wanted to go right through Russia. He, he didn't like the Russians. And uh, in, in fact, <laughs> I probably shouldn't say this. Uh, he and Trump have the same personalities. And both their mouth gets them into trouble. Trump was in a lot of trouble because of his mouth, but he helped win the war. Think about that. He helped win a war. I don't, you know, if you had your house full of rats, who are you going to call? An exterminator? You don't care what he looks like? How many times he's been married? You know, what he talks like? You don't care. Get rid of the damn rats. Okay. I've known this guy for a while. I, I, I met George, whatever, eight, nine years ago at the Freedom Committee, and he's talking about these DVDs. And it's important to put your money where your mouth is. So I'm going to do that. But here's the deal. I have either four or five of the ones he has. And these are not little family documentaries of here we are on the Omaha beach or something like that. These are great DVDs, each about different subjects. One of them is on the Henri Chapelle Cemetery in Belgium that he mentioned. And it's it's P. Know, George. People yeah, you in want Europe to are adopting George. Okay. of Americans there. Even there's even a German guy who like adopted five graves. He was happy that the Americans came and got rid of Hitler, got rid of Hitler for him. 
And I mean, the, that ended up inspiring Take the one more question. To get oh, sure. One yeah. more. A neighbor okay. of mine, her brother was killed okay. September one more. 24, 1944. Tell that me. Have any of the school districts ever bought your videos? Not in, Not in California. Not in California. No, none. Any DVD purchase today, it's 15 bucks. I will pay $7 of the 15. Any DVD you want to buy, I'll pay seven. You pay eight to show that you've got something in the game here. So that's the deal. They're great. They're not home, little home videos. They're professionally done. They're great. Get it this deep. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Uh, 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 one of my supporters here, uh, and I thank you in front of all these people. One, you know, it's. It's not easy. I mean, everybody's hit up. There's so many good charities out there. You know, like St. Jude's, that's my favorite charity. And after that is Gary Sinise for what he does. And so uh, it's hard. We're all asked to donate money here, there, and everywhere, you know. And I'm not a wealthy guy, you know. I, and I do this for no profit, absolutely no profit. Uh, and uh, what I want to do now, however, in my old age, I need a few bucks. <laughs> So what I want to do now is I want, if any, anyone has any contacts with uh, a speaker's bureau where, where I can speak to big groups, corporations, where they have employees come in, where I can tailor my talk to what I'm talking to, as I do with kids or whomever, with veterans. It's, it's very hard to talk to veterans. The first time I talked here when Jack Hammett was running this place, as Robbie can tell you and a few others, I broke down. I've, I've, uh, I'm pretty good now about that. Uh, not, not 100 percent, but when I start to get into certain things, uh, you know, it hits me, and I gotta, I gotta keep from losing it. All right. But anyway, thank you, Scott, All for right. having me here. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Can I still get one, one question? He, he, he said that I, I can take one more question. That's fellow over here. Talk up so I can hear you. Uh, sure. Uh, my father was 78 years old before he was able to tell everything in detail of the service during World War II. During the time we were growing up, he didn't want to hear anything except we were watching TV war movies. What, uh, after all the traumatic, uh, after the trauma you suffered, what, uh, how old were you when you were able to finally tell your story and tell what happened to you? How old was I? How old were you when you were first able to talk about this? Uh, wow, that's a good question. Probably, probably not until I went back for the 50, 50th, that was the first time I went back was 50 years later, the 50th anniversary. And after going over there, and I was with a few other, uh, I was with a guy that said he thinks about the war every day. His buddy was shot to death right next to him on Omaha Beach. So uh, since, since going back, for the 50th, which was in 94, uh, uh, I've been talking about it. But I didn't start doing films till 2006. And uh, once I did one, I was only going to do one, and then first thing you do, I'm doing a second, third, fourth, fifth, and now the sixth. And, and this one is my swan song. I mean, it's a lot of work. I, I hate to end it, but we, we need to finish our... Uh, you'll be here for a few minutes afterwards. Yeah, I'll be here for a few minutes. I heard that your wife is still shopping, and uh, she well, wants you to. Well, I'm supposed to call her when I'm through. Okay. <laughs> so. How many of these videos do you have? Oh, I have business cards up here. You can go on my website. You have don't, six six videos, right? Yeah. Don't buy anything on a website. Just send me an email. Fifteen dollars. I pay for shipping and everything. Fifteen dollars. And if you don't like it, send it back. All right. And, a big round of a hand.